you don't shut your stupid milkshake, stick it, bake cheesy fist, dick truck driver, bed bath, the beyond employee, the month midget, plastic fork, lamppost, dusty keyboard, belt buckle, leg warmer, center block, Canadian flag, soy sauce, packet looking ass up, my nigga, you stupid hairy motherfucker. <laughs> Life is handy and soda When I get drunk, I see your face Attached to all these hoes shoulders Ask my friends, I'm a loner I really hate being sober Cause I remember everything From my past is not over Because of you I can't trust no one My fucking fraud on I don't know what to do Because of you Stuck in my emotions Really cut me open And it's bleeding right through Because of you It's like I don't have a I'm Andy, and I started Harry's, the shaving company that's fixing shaving. At Harry's, we keep it simple. We make sharp, durable blades and offer them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We obsess over quality so much that we do crazy things, like buy a German razor blade factory. So give us a try with this special offer. Get a Harry starter set with a five-blade razor, weighted handle, shave gel, and a travel cover, all for only 3 bucks with free shipping. Just go to harrys.com and enter 0044 at checkout. That's harrys.com, code 0044. Hey, Spotifyers, click or tap the banner to listen to Disney Channel hits. Sing along to your favorite past and present Disney Channel hits. Brought to you by Disney Plus and Sneakerella. Lace up and dream. Streaming May 13th, only on Disney Plus. Subscription required. Ain't nothing fresher than my kicks.
everybody. Happy Torch Thursday. How's everyone doing on this particular wonderful Thursday where we are going to use torches and light fires, saw things. We're, it's going to be a really fun day. So how's, how's everyone doing out there wherever you are in the wilds of the internet this evening? I'm slightly concerned that I don't see any chat. So we're going to redo this and hopefully I have sound and all of the appropriate things. Yay! Hi Corvus! Hi Tallyfet! <laughs> oh, nice weather. Lori is just rubbing it in the face. Though, weirdly enough, my dad sent me a photo from Wisconsin like two hours ago it's 91 degrees in Wisconsin in May that's like not normal that's weird yay life is good in Richardson that's awesome good to hear that everybody is doing well so what are we doing today that's a great question. Um, so our uh, Torch Thursday project is going to be this one. So um, this is for, for all of those of you who still have longer locks. This is a sawn and soldered hair fork, but if making, you know, hair decorations isn't your thing, you get very, Smee! Hi Smee! Oh, 64 degree. Don't let Heather know that. She's going to run away. To Canada and I don't want that that's not gonna work out well for me um, so if hair fork hair decorations is not your thing this could very easily also be a pendant and um, I'll kind of talk you through how that would go if you wanted to do that so let's talk tools and supplies for this evening's tutorial oh there it is okay <laughs> no, you can't go. I forbid it. No. I will get my smoker. Do I have to get a smoker so I can smoke you potatoes here? Okay. <laughs> you have to be on your side. <laughs> Heather really wants to run away for can run away to Canada. I mean, for the most part, she could work remote from Canada for stream stuff, but and <laughs> so potatoes. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay, now y'all are just reminding me that I'm really hungry. So let's talk about tools and supplies for this evening's tutorial. Alright, so um this was actually kind of this project was the hair fork was kind of sparked by, I know, right, Talifa? Me too. So, you know, uh, but I have to teach a tutorial, so you're going to have to eat for both of us. Um, so this tutorial was kind of sparked by one of the metal smithing groups I'm in on Facebook, because one of the, thank you, see, Talifa's got my back. Um, one of the members of the group was trying to make hair forks and was having difficulty because of the gauges of wire that she was using and I was like, oh right, well that's actually a pretty cool project, so, so let's try that. So let's talk tools and supplies for this evening's tutorial. So you don't need to make an eye. I am going to make an eye just because um, I want to show you guys a really cool trick for making a nice eye shape without printing out a template. Or anything and I'm actually gonna make an eye with a tiger eye very similar to this one because that's about how much energy I have because it's Thursday evening so you are going to need some copper bronze or brass sheet sorry that's the price for the whole sheet also this is a fun thing uh, when you're a bead store owner and you pretty much live in perpetual chaos sometimes you have to note down a number hi Barb um, and the only thing you have to write it down on is a piece of metal. So yeah, that, that was a, a, an amount for a bill from a vendor and I had nothing near me that I could write on except for this piece of copper. So that is why it is, um, there. So 24 gauge copper sheet. Now you can cut this with shears. I'm actually going to cut this with, um, 
a saw tonight just because it's fun. Also, you get a little bit nicer edge. You're also going to need, in addition to your 24 copper bronze or brass sheet, you're going to need some 12 gauge wire. Okay, that's my preferred gauge of wire for hair forks because it's pretty hard without you having to do a whole lot to work hard in it. So this is a good gauge that's not going to bend too much on you. In addition to your 12 gauge bronze wire, you're going to need a little bit of... 16 gauge wire and um, that's going to be for the decoration now if you've got something like beaded wire or something fancy schmancy you could absolutely use that as well in that position you're gonna need okay really there it is um you're gonna need some bezel wire uh, this is one eighth inch fine silver bezel strip that's a good all-purpose size and that's gonna work well to set our stone, you are going to need a cabochon. This is a um, lovely tiger eye cabochon, about three quarters of an inch in diameter. You're going to need some 20 gauge wire that's going to be for these little decorative bits. Now, obviously, if you're not doing an eye, the little eyelashes aren't necessary, but you know, just kind of be aware that you, you can take a finer gauge of wire and you can use it to make sort of decorative and dimensional bits that you can then solder onto your hair fork. So I've got some 20 gauge sterling silver wire right here. And then you're going to need some easy solder. Ooh, you're going to make an earthquake on your stream when you smack your camera, but you're going to need some easy solder and ideally some extra easy solder as well. Not quite new. Yeah, extra easy solder went. I have a really hard time keeping track of solder. So I might wind up doing this whole thing with easy, which wouldn't be the end of the world. Now, why am I using on my project tonight? Why am I using copper instead of brass or bronze? It's because this is a pretty involved project. And I don't want to have to mess around with super pickle in addition to everything else. So um, when you are soldering with brass or bronze, when you heat it and then pickle it, what's going to happen is you're going to wind up with essentially copper depletion gilding on the surface of your metal, and then you're going to have to remove that with an additional chemical process called super pickling, which, um, considering, again, I know, but don't eat this particular pickle, Tally Fett, because not, not good, not good. Mm -mm. Don't drink the pickle. But um, it's just an extra step in an already involved project. But Tally Fett's teasing me. It's not nice. Have another one for me, please. So if you... Thank you, Ring Light, for stopping being dumb. Hmm. <laughs> Hey, more people, welcome to the Eating Dream Stream. So we're just talking about tools and supplies um, and why I'm using copper for this project instead of brass or bronze is just because of the need for super pickle to fix the depletion gilding that happens when you solder and pickle brass or, focus on me please, camera, thank you, brass or bronze. Um, but you absolutely could use those metals. You would just need to do that additional step of super pickling. And I will try to put a brass or bronze torch project on the stream in the next couple of weeks so we can revisit super pickle and like how it works and and all of that but for now um we're gonna go ahead and start the project now as far as tools go it's a soldering tutorial you're gonna need a whole bunch of stuff if you already fabricate metal you probably have all of this stuff um kind of collated into a work area that you use for Whoa, what what did I just do? I swear, you touch a thing and everything goes crazy. Um, so included but not limited to including but not limited to a torch. Um, I of course have my favorite laser butane torch. You are going to need a soldering surface. You do need a purpose built soldering surface, so um, a solderite board, a charcoal brick, 
uh, kiln brick, any of those will work. I'm a fan of solderite boards just because they're less um, messy than charcoal bricks. bricks. Um, so funny story about Super Pickle, just for Corvus. So when I was trying to figure out the best recipe for Super Pickle, I googled on the interwebs, Super Pickle. And I got a whole bunch of graphics of pickles flying in capes. And I'm like, that was not what I was going for. So then I then I googled super pickle metal smithing and I got what I was actually looking for. But yeah, just like da 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 super pickle. I mean, seriously, this is what the internet has to offer. Um, so, torch, soldering surface, you're going to need um, your hand tools, round nose pliers, chain nose pliers, wire cutters, you're going to need a saw and a bench pin, you're going to need uh, to make your eye shape a circle template, and um, I didn't bring out any pickles, so we're going to have a fairly rustic looking piece. <laughs> Uh, tonight and uh, you're also in order to buff the ends of your hair fork so that it doesn't rip the actual hairs out of your head you're gonna need some you're gonna need a file you're gonna need some 320 grit sandpaper and you're gonna need some steel wool so let's go ahead and start by marking out and sawing our eye shape so that means that I need this Well, we all know where Ace's brain is. That's fair. This is not news. Okay, so I'm going to take my copper. And the easiest way to make an eye shape is to use a circle template and decide what size you're going to make. And that's going to kind of be determined by the size of your stone. Like, I kind of feel like maybe the slightly bigger one is going to be better. This is tiger eyes a little bit bigger than my prototype. So I'm going to take my circle template and I'm just going to draw around about three quarters of the circle. And then I'm going to take my circle template and I'm just going to lower it down. So what I'm looking at now is the, the proportions of this space in here. Like what do I like? Do I like it? That, that doesn't really look look like an eye that's a little bit too round. So I think that's about good. So I'm going to draw that. And there you go. So that is my eye. So I'm going to cut on um, this line here, this line here. I'm just going to double check. And yes, that does look good with my stone. So we are good to go. Now, um, it's definitely helpful when you are sawing. This is where it's really unfortunate that I don't currently have a metal shears back here. But that's okay. I have a saw, and saws work great. So, um, when you're sawing, it's always a good idea to sort of excise the area that your shape is in. Because if you try and saw off of the whole sheet, sometimes you'll get trapped, you'll get stuck, your um, saw won't work because only so deep and also it's just awkward so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my bench pin so I I don't think you can blame Corvus for that ace possibly two halves of the same demented brain but I feel like she does not have culpability for that particular you know thing I'm just guessing so this is a clip-on bench pin, and um, this is what I use because I don't have a permanent jeweler's bench where I can have uh, a bench pin on it all the time. And so this is just going to clip onto, or clamp, clip is not the right word, clamp onto my work surface. Um, and so there is my bench pin. So. The reason that bench pins are really something that is important when you're sawing is when you're sawing, 
you need to support your metal with both sides. So a bench pin allows you to do that. And let's see if I can maybe, um, it's like I can get it, if, can I get it to focus on the bench pin now? Maybe, and then I'm gonna have to refocus it when I'm doing the soldering in a minute. But I would like you to see actually how the soldering, or sorry, the sawing works, so. waiting for my fingernails to come in focus. So anyway, uh, while I'm messing with my camera, um, let's talk briefly about what's upcoming on the Beating Dreams stream. So tomorrow is our crafty cocktail time. That means that we are going to be on Zoom tomorrow night. Now you will not find us on Facebook, you will not find us on Twitch, you will find us, there we go, on Zoom tomorrow night with crafty cocktail time. Crafty cocktail time is free crafting time. That means you can work on whatever you want. It doesn't even have to be a bead craft. Hell, you don't even have to work on a craft. You can just hang out and, um, oh, I'm sorry, Tally Fett. We shall miss you. But physical therapy is important. Absolutely. Like doing things that will reduce your level of pain on a daily basis is totally worthwhile. Um, but so, Crafty Cocktail Time tomorrow, 6 p.m. Central Time. If you've Zoomed with us before, the credentials are the same. If you've never Zoomed with us before, then um, you can feel free to email us, beatingdreamstylus at gmail.com, and we'll get those credentials to you. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load up my saw blades. So saw blades are like guitar strings. They don't work well unless they have tension on them. So I've got my saw blade loaded into the bottom part of my saw. And I'm just going to um, press my saw. That's a terrible, sorry, I put my bench pin in an awful position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my saw and I'm going to compress it against my table. So I'm basically just going to push in on the saw and see how that bows the blade. Then I'm going to resituate the blade in this top receptacle here, and then I'm going to go ahead and twist it closed and let go. And what should happen is my blade should have a lot of nice, lovely tension on it, and that is what we need in order to make our sawing work. Now I'm going to go ahead and take my blade and I'm going to excise the part that I'm going to be sawing. So I'm just going to kind of do a rough cut around this eye shape using my saw blade. Now, let's talk while I'm doing this about lubrication. Lubrication is very important in some particular context. But for sawing, I don't actually use a lubricant on my saw blade. <laughs> oh, says the, yeah, um, <laughs> says the person who's not tone deaf, unlike me. Um, so, so basically, if, you know, the higher the note, the better your saw is going to cut. Like, the more tension you have on your saw, the better, easier time you're going to have um, cutting. So, um, <laughs> so um, a lot of people will lubricate their saw blades, and, and for a lot of folks, it does make it easier to saw. I have never found that lubrication really helps my sawing, so I don't use it, but that's not to say that you shouldn't. As far as lubricants, um, types of lubricants that you can use, oh dear, Tally Fat, that sucks. Um, 
The easiest one is one that probably exists right in your kitchen is a little bit of olive oil. You can just put it on your finger and um, stroke it onto the blade when you're lubricating your blade. Um, if you go down, you're not going to get stabbed. If you go up, you're probably not going to get stabbed either, but down is easier. Um, or uh, beeswax or a commercial lubricant like Burlite that's designed for cutting tools. Um, those are things that come in kind of blocks and you can just um, run your saw over them to get lubricant on the blade. But I, I tend to just go it without and that works fine for me. Now, when you're sawing, you want to make sure to support your metal on both sides of the V-slot. Um, so there are lots of ways you can do this. You can go this way. You can actually go through the saw blade because there are no teeth on this side. You just want to make sure, obviously, that your finger is not right in the path of the blade. So the first thing I'm going to do, again, is my rough cut. Just to get my piece of metal out of the larger sheet. And I think I can cheat a little bit. I can actually do this cut while I'm doing it. I'm going to see if that works. I may regret this decision. Now, when you're sawing, you want to make sure to hold your blade straight up and down. Okay, don't lead with the top of the saw. Just straight up and down. And don't push forward too hard with your saw because then your saw is going to wind up getting bound up in your metal. Okay, so I've reached the end of my ability to do this. You know why? Because my saw is hitting my metal. So at this point I'm just going to kind of break off and go straight and continue to cut this out of my larger sheet of metal. So this is why you want to kind of remove the rough cut shape from your metal because your saw is only so deep and again, you know, you get to a point where you've literally sawn yourself into a corner. You literally cannot cut the shape that you want to cut. So now that I have sort of rough cut that out of my metal, now I've got enough maneuverability that I can go ahead and take my saw and I can finish this up. So I'm just going to, um, once again, support it from both sides of my V-slot. And I'm just going to follow the line that I drew. shape. So the key for anybody who, okay, so for anybody who's a novice um, sawer, first of all, you're going to break a lot of, break a lot of blades. The reason primarily that one will break blades is because you're either pushing forward too much or your saw gets bound up and you're kind of wiggling it to get it free. So in order to minimize the breakage of your blades, think about your saw as just going straight up and down, that it, that it doesn't actually push forward, it just goes straight up and down, and I promise it will kind of move its way through the metal on its own. Supporting from both sides is really important. The more your metal vibrates, the more often your blades will break. So now I've come to a turn. So what I need to do is I need to kind of tread water with my saw, I'm going to move my saw up and down until I've aligned it now with my next line. Um, so your saw really only has one gear, it only goes forward, it does no backwards. Um, as far as speed goes, if a, a lot of beginning saws will, once they've kind of mastered the, the angles and everything, they'll just saw like this, with like really, really short strokes. So. If you're impatient, if you want more speed, the key to that is the more of the blade you use, the more metal you will cut in each stroke. So, you know, the more comfortable you get with this and the more you're using your entire saw blade, as you can see, the faster it's going to eat through your metal and the faster you're going to get to the end of your cut. But, but really, it's the length of the stroke. It's not pushing forward that makes it go faster. Sometimes it's hard to internalize, but I promise with this, that is the way that it works. Okay, 
Okay, now you want to be careful of this right here. So you see how my finger um, is right in front of the saw blade? Now at this point, there's really no danger that I'm going to cut myself as long as I... <laughs> Megan just offered a unique perspective on sawing techniques because she's a doctor. <laughs> For anybody who didn't see Megan's comment, which is amazing, by the way, freaking fantastic cross-disciplinary um, skills here, but um, Megan says, study fluid strokes is best if it's similar to going through bone because you don't want to stop midstream and get caught and not be able to move without breaking your saw blade, adding in a patient's bone. So yeah. It, it, it's truly interesting sometimes in jewel, jewelry where you, you get those kind of cross-disciplinary things. You're like, oh, yeah, that, that, that principle is universal, whether you're sawing metal, whether you're sawing wood, or whether you're sawing a bone. That's what's called bad form. Oh, my lanta. Okay, so back to not murdering yourself with the saw blade. So, um, when I'm sawing right here, I can I can put my finger here, and I'm in no danger of cutting myself as long as I make sure that my finger stays, you know, a solid couple of millimeters away from the saw blade. But, when we get to the end of the cut, what's going to happen is your saw blade is going to jump, because all of a sudden it's going to be completely, you know, without resistance. So, um, what I'm going to do is as I progress to the end of my saw cut, I'm going to make sure that my fingers are well out of the way of the saw blade. So watch what happens when I get to the end of this cut. You're going to see it's going to jump forward and it's going to hit on the, the edge of my bench pin. Did you see that? Where it kind of jumped forward? Again, that's because I have I have lost, you know, I've got no resistance. <laughs> and so that's my basic eye shape. Now, I don't really want, you know, it's a little bit rough now, and I don't want that necessarily in my finished product. So I'm going to, eh, going to attempt to remove my bench pin from my table. Yes, there it goes. Okay, I'm going to take my bench pin off my table. And then I'm going to do a little bit of finishing on the edges of my piece. So I'm going to take some 320 grit sandpaper and I'm just going to sand around the edges of my eye. And I'm not going to lie, this is easier to do off camera, so I'm just taking my sandpaper and... Hi Sophia! Ha 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 ha! So Max and Turbo apparently are a match for each other and hopefully are making your life a little easier by tuckering each other out. Alright, and then after I've gone with um, 320 grit sandpaper around this whole thing, I'm going to grab some steel wool and this is um, triple zero steel wool and I'm just going to go around the edge with my steel wool and what that's going to do is it's going to make my edges nice and smooth because even though this is going in the hair and not on the neck, it's you still don't want metal edges that feel like they're going to lacerate you. Oh, well that's not so good. Boo on the, the starting at 4 a.m., but at least Turbo's got a panel. Okay, so I've got my eye shape. So now it's time to make all of the decorative bits that are going to go on this and then to solder them on. So once again, let me grab my Sharpie and fix some... Oh, well, it's actually it's pretty well focused. Cool. I don't have to fix anything. It's amazing. So how you decorate this is completely up to you. You have literally infinite possibilities. So what I've chosen for tonight, the techniques I've chosen to kind of weed out 
and show y'all is um, bezel setting a stone, framing the bezel setting in a piece of wire, and then some dimensional wire work that's actually soldered to the back of the piece. So I'm going to start by um, forming my bezel for my stone, which means I need my fine silver bezel strip. This is one eighth of an inch tall. This is, in my opinion, the Um, one eighth inch bezel strip, if, if you're only going to be able to keep one size of bezel strip in stock, eighth of an inch is a really good size because it, it works for a whole lot of different cabochons. Okay, this is, I had it, I had it at the beginning of the broadcast and now my stone is gone. I mean, it can't, oh, no, it's under my bench pin. See, I knew it wasn't gone, it just was, you know, misplaced. <laughs> okay, so I've got my stone and my 1 8 inch bezel strip. Again, 1 8 if, if you're just going to pick one, because I realized that fine silver bezel strip is not inexpensive, um, 1 8 inch would be what I would recommend to anybody that they would pick, because, again, it goes with a pretty wide variety of stones. So I've got myself a piece of my 1 8 inch bezel strip and I'm just going to wrap it around my stone. Since the bezel strip is fine silver and it's dead soft, you don't have to deal with as many issues with your wire sort of springing up as you do when you're dealing with um, regular wire, like I'm going to be dealing with in just a minute, but you still want to make sure that you got a nice tight Fit. Okay, because that right there, that's not going to work. So I'm going to make myself a nice tight fit around my stone. Okay, like so. So you can see there's not much airspace. And then I'm going to grab my sharpie and I'm going to mark where I have to cut this. So I, I did a bad job of showing this because it's kind of hidden under my index finger, but that cut line is going to go right there. And then I'm going to take my wire cutters. I want to make sure I have the flush side towards the part that's remaining, not the waist. And I'm just going to snip that off. Okay, so that's my bezel, and um, like I said, you do need a file for this project. You probably need a file for almost any fabrication project that you do, because they're just one of those things that you really can't live without, because you always, it seems, have to true up an edge, or true up a joint, or, you know, just fix something. So then I'm going to take my file. And I'm just going to catch the edges of this and see how that edge right there isn't completely perpendicular. Like what, what I want, what would happen in an ideal world is I would have cut it straight so that, that I had a perfect right angle edge here. I don't. So I'm going to take my file and I'm just going to file that flat like so. Make sure you don't curve it. Make sure you keep it straight. There we go. And then turn it around. Do the same with the other side if necessary. This one's actually pretty good. I did a much better job of cutting that. And then I'm going to take my ends and I'm going to do what's called the tension fit. So I'm just going to move those ends past each other and get them so that they will line up and hold tension against one another without me having to hold it. Now at this point, it does not matter. I mean, it matters if you can actually see. Sometimes that means you have to take off the glasses, but it does not matter at this point if it's round or not. Um, that's something that we're gonna be able to fix in a minute after we've soldered it. All right, so I've got my ends fitted together to make my joint. Now I'm gonna make my decorative ring of 16 gauge wire. 
um, that's going to go around the outside of my bezel. So I've just got a piece of 16 gauge wire here. And I'm just going to make a circle that's slightly bigger than the diameter of this stone. And the easiest way to do that is to grab your ring mandrel or ring stick. Now, this is regular wire, so this is going to spring up a bit. So, you know, if my stone's about this big, I'm going to go up just a little bit from that my wire against my mandrel just bring it round so that it overlaps like so and this is what I mean for anybody who's not familiar when I say wire springs up is when I let go see how that's now a much bigger circle than it was let's just check that should be perfect it's just a little bigger but it's not too giant and then I want to go ahead and flush cut my two ends and file them just like I did with my bezel. So when you got a circle like this, what you want to do if you're if minimizing waste is your goal, is you want to find right where this straight bit starts to curve. So see, this is obviously not a good curved part of my circle, but see right here where all of a sudden these two curves align, and that's where I'm gonna cut. So I'm going to use my flush cutters, don't forget the flat side is the flush side, and I want to leave that to, or sorry, point that to what's going to be my, my remaining bit. So I flush cut that end, then I'm going to flip my cutters around, and flush cut that end, and that is my 16 gauge wire circle. And then I'm going to take that, file it, tension fit it, just like we did our bezel. And once again, this also doesn't really, re um, doesn't really need to be round at this point, because that's what ring mandrels are for. So you just want to make sure you get it nice and tension fit. So, so that it's lined up. Like so. And now we are ready to solder our two pieces into complete circles. So that's my bezel setting and my 16 gauge wire loop. So I'm going to grab my solder board. I'm going to grab my flux. And I'm going to locate a crappy paintbrush to put my flux on my work. And it's a crappy paintbrush. So I'm going to take my pieces, I'm going to put them onto my board, and I'm going to flux them. So, flux for anybody out there who's not familiar is a chemical that you put on your metal and what it does is it keeps your metal from oxidizing and that allows your soldering to actually happen. So the first thing that happens if you just hit metal that is not a pure silver or pure gold with a flame is it's going to turn black. That black layer is called oxide or fire scale. And the main thing about it that's important is that solder cannot flow through that oxide layer. So, if you're soldering and you get that oxide layer, your soldering is going to be done. Like, that, that's the end of your soldering. So, what we do is we use this particular chemical called flux. There's lots of different fluxes out there. This one is, uh, sorry y'all, mm. that was a yawn on the stream. It's been a. It, 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 it's been a exactly, um, but so uh, this is a borax-based flux, but there are lots of other fluxes out there. So um, they all work essentially the same way. They all serve the same purpose, but you know you gotta find which one, as a metalsmith, you're more comfortable with working with. Um, I when I learned, my instructor used liquid flux, and it turns out I hate liquid flux. It's 
absolutely one of my least favorite things on the planet. So then I discovered this. This is Paste Flux, and I love it because it stays where you put it. Again, not everybody's cup of tea. You're just going to find out what you like. So I painted my Flux. Um, and by the way, this is Handy Flux brand. So I painted my Flux on my two joints. So I'm going to find my Easy Solder. Which again, I know is around here somewhere because I saw it. There it is. I put it in front of me so that I wouldn't lose it. And I'm going to cut myself two very small pieces of my easy solder. Now let's talk for a minute about what does it mean when I say easy solder after I pick up my wire cutters. It means that this is solder that is 65% silver and the remainder of the alloy is zinc. What zinc does, since it has a very low melting point, is it lowers the melting point of the entire alloy down below the melting point of my silver metal. Now, um, they make solder with actually different amounts of zinc in it, so you've got um, going from the top, the closest to actual sterling silver would be hard solder, then medium, then easy, then extra easy. So as you go down that scale, you gain more zinc in the alloy and you get a lower melting point for your solder. So this is easy, 65% zinc, 25%? No, no. 35% because math is a thing that I used to know. Um, sterling silver and then sterling silver is an alloy of silver and copper so if you're a mathy type of your silver copper alloy 92.5% is silver the remainder is copper so your solder is a combination of 65% of that sterling silver alloy and then 35% um, of your zinc. And it is astonishing how little solder you need to close a joint. Wow, that's really bright. I feel like that should be less bright. So let me uh, fix that for a minute. should be easier to see the flame and just a minute when I do at that exposure so it's astonishing how little it takes to close a joint so my two pieces of solder that I cut are going to be very very small about one millimeter and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to place each piece of solder underneath the joint that I'm trying to close so I'm just going to set my solder there And I'm going to set my piece on top of my solder with the joint resting on your solder, okay? You can't put the solder on the opposite edge of your piece. That's not going to work. you got to place the joint right onto your solder. And there we go. So now we're going to heat our pieces and flow our solder. So... Um, if anybody is not familiar with torches and how they work and what you should do to keep yourself safe in either home workspace or community workspace, go ahead and type exclamation point S safety into the Twitch chat. That'll give you a link to my five point soldering safety lecture. You know, the upshot is exercise common sense. If you're in your own workspace, if you're in community workspace, and of course, especially if you're in a community workspace, go ahead and pay close attention to what the people who are running that workspace are saying. I promise they're not trying to harsh on your soldering experience. They're really just trying to keep everyone safe. So um, now that everyone has uh, gotten the link to the safety lecture, I'm going to light my torch and I'm going to heat these pieces. So the way that this is going to work is I'm going to heat around each piece. I need to get everything nice and warm. And then I'm going to put 
focus on the joint and there we go. Did you see my solder? It just kind of sucked up into my joint. I'm going to do the same thing with my bezel. Heat the whole thing and focus on the joint and wham bam. So this is one of the reasons why I love putting my solder underneath is you've got a really, really definitive visual indicator of when your solder is flowed because your, your piece will literally shift downward. Now those are going to need to cool for a minute. While that's happening, I'm going to grab my 12 gauge wire and I'm just going to cut myself about 10 inches of that. Now that's going to be variable depending on how long you want your hair fork to be, but I find that 10 inches is a good kind of average length for that. <laughs> Disregard Heather's chortling. Yes, please disregard. <laughs> and unless you're on the same mental wavelength as here as her, and then by all means have a good chortle. So I cut myself ten inches of my twelve gauge wire. I'm gonna find approximately the middle, which of course is five inches. And then I just want to take that and I'm going to use my ring stick for this. I'm just going to bend it to make um, a U shape or a hairpin shape. Then as a formerly long haired person, um, I like my hair forks better. Eek. I like my hair forks better if they've got um, some little kind of textured bits in them so that they grab my hair. So I'm going to use my ring mandrel. And so the way this is going to work is, apparently I'm going to misplace everything multiple times tonight, which is super exciting. So the way, this, the way this is going to work is it's going to solder on like so. So I want to go after my curve about an inch or so down, and then I'm going to start waving my wire. So I'm going to take my ring mandrel and I'm going to bend it out, and then I'm going to move my ring mandrel to the opposite side. I'm going to bend it back towards the center, and then move my ring, ring mandrel back to the outside, back out, and then I want to go ahead and grab my chain nose pliers and I'm going to bring that then back to center. So that's what I have and then I'm going to repeat that on the other side and um, if you try to kind of oppose it, it tends to look neater but I'm not always great at that so we'll see how I do. Spread out and in, out and take your chain nose and go back centered. Okay, and if it's gotten all out of plane like this, that's easy to fix. Just kind of bend everything back. And ideally, you want your hair fork to not be super wide. So you want to bring everything you know back in so that your total width is not more than I would say an inch and a half at the bottom. So that's my little part that's actually going to go through my hair. And these right now, these little end bits that I cut my, with my wire cutter are so incredibly stabby and jabby and snaggy that like my hair hurts just thinking about it. So I'm going to take a minute with my 320 grit sandpaper and I'm just going to sand those down. And again, that's something that's easier for me to do off camera, but I'm just going to sand those down. So I'm just taking my sandpaper and just kind of going all around the end until I can rub my finger on it and it doesn't feel scratchy. to you can grab some 320 steel wool not sorry 320 triple zero steel wool and and even make that a little bit finer so now I've got my hair fork actually made and I've got my bezel and my decoration made so now I'm gonna grab my ring mandrel 
and round these out. So I'm going to take my bezel and I'm just going to push it down my ring handle. And pull it off and now I should have a nice circle. I'm going to do the same thing with my decoration. There's a nice circle there. Now I need to do one more thing as far as decoration that's going to be soldered onto my little eye-shaped hair fork and that is the eyelashes. So for the eyelashes I'm going to grab my 20 gauge wire and I'm going to cut myself a foot of it. It's probably more than I need but I would rather have too much than not enough. So to make my little eyelashes, I'm just going to use my chain nose pliers. So that goes like this. Leave yourself a little bit of extra on the end. Grab with your chain nose pliers and bend a 90 degree angle like so. Now decide how long you want your little eyelashes to be. I'm going to go up about yay far. Grab with your chain nose. I cut a foot, Lori, of 20 gauge and just bend it over so you have something like this. Now what you want to do after this is compress this end because that just makes it look neater. So just take your chain nose, grab around the edges of it, and squeeze. So you get this little fold in your wire. Then I'm going to take my chain nose and bend my wire flat. So now I have kind of a horizon line with this little sprout coming up from it. And then we're going to do it again. So I'm going to go about a quarter of an inch. And again, I'm going to bend 90 degrees. I'm going to go up about the same level. Flip it back down, compress your fold, like so, and then bend it straight out. So I'm going to continue to do this until I have enough of these little sort of eyelash parts to go around my entire eye. In the case of my sample, that was seven little sprouts. So we're just going to go ahead and make seven little sprouts. See how that goes. So once again, if you're not a hair decoration person, this doesn't have to be a hair fork. It could very easily be a pendant. It could very easily be a component for a bracelet. It could even be the centerpiece of a ring. So don't feel like just because I've chosen to use these techniques tonight to create a hair fork means that that's what you have to do. Because you absolutely, that was my brain saying obviously and absolutely at the same time, it doesn't work so well, but you absolutely do not have to use them in this context. You can use them however you want. Techniques are just tools, so use your tools however you need to. Just make sure you got some good ones in your toolbox, and you can do almost anything. Alright, that's five of my little eyelashes. I got two more. Okay, so that is all 
of my little eyelashy bits. They're not completely even, that's totally fine. It's an organic project, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, can you build yourself a Jason Momoa Corvus? I think that that really depends on how good are you with a pair of pliers. Because I feel like if you're good enough with a pair of pliers, you can build yourself anything. Okay, so now it's time to sort of start putting this together. So I'm going to take my eye, and I'm going to flux it. <laughs> And then we're going to drop my bezel into the middle of it. So step one, it's going to be zip my bezel down to my back, back plate. That means I need four small pieces of solder. And then those four pieces of solder are going to go on the inside of my bezel. One, two, three. I knew that was going to happen. Always hit my bezel. Four. Put the bezel back where it was supposed to be. That This is a problem. See, that solder has kind of um, hopped to the outside. You just want to grab that, put that back inside, and just position your bezel so that it's centered on the piece that you've sawn out. All right, then we're going to heat this whole thing, and we're going to flow that solder to join our bezel to our piece. So we're just going to heat the whole thing. Again, metal is a heat sink, so you got to heat the whole thing or your, or your solder is never going to flow. Focus on the back plate, that's the biggest part of metal, that's going to be the biggest heat sink. And once everything gets nice and warm, your solder will float. careful not to belt your bezel wire. It's thin and takes up heat really, really quickly. So again, focus your flame on the back plate and then I am sort of moving back and forth between focusing on the solder, focusing on the back plate, and that's mainly because I don't want to melt this bezel. Okay, so what's happening here does not seem to me to be a heat thing. It seems to be a dirt thing. This is the thing about sterling silver solder and metals, is they are extra princessy. So if the metal is dirty, solder doesn't want to flow. So you know what keeps the metal from getting dirty is flux. So sometimes a quick fix for something like this is to dab some more flux on it and then you heat it, see how it goes. This is 
if I'm having a problem is my torch is running out of fuel. So, <clears throat> if you're using a butane torch, there are no regulators or anything to tell you what the fuel level in your tank is. Um, so, you know, a couple ways you can figure that out is number one, like when did you last fill your torch? How much soldering have you done since then? But number two is your flame is just going to start getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the smaller it gets, the cooler it gets, and the less likely it is it's going to be able to successfully solder. So I have now a much better sized flame. Let's try one more time to get this solder to flow. that I've got some kind of a, <laughs> got some kind of a tool, um, in case I need to press down on my bezel, but I think really what I just need to do is sort of coax that solder now that everything is nice and hot, um, to go underneath the bezel, make sure I don't push it off center like I just did, bad choices, alright, there we go, sort of heat everything, and what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a solder kind of pulling through on the outside edge. Also Corvus Me Too, which is unfortunate since I'm the one who's teaching this tutorial. <laughs> it is kind of mesmerizing, it's true. So this is a very large piece of metal, that's why it's taking so incredibly long. Like, I did get some of it to zip up under there. So be careful with your solder pick. I mean, hey, Corvus, whatever works for you. So at this point, I think I'm going to add a little bit more flux and a little bit more solder. 
This is very hot, by the way, just in case anyone was wondering. And carbs, I do not know if playing with fire before sleep is actually the best idea. I feel like when playing with fire, one should be fairly alert. But, you know, you do you. I'm not the one who's paying your fire insurance, so cheers. Alright, we're going to try this one more time, see if I can get this to solder. This is a very large piece of metal, and my torch might not be up to it tonight. I'm hoping it is. Um, if I can't get this bezel zipped down for y'all, I'll just continue on with the rest of the decorations. And this will just be one without a stone. Alright, so I got that one to zip. I'm just trying to get this one to zip. There we go. Okay, so what I'm, what again, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the solder to kind of flow around that bezel. And there we go. Okay, so now that is attached on there. Now I'm going to set that aside for a minute. I'm going to take my decorative circle that I made. I'm going to flux that. No fire before bed. Exactly, Corvus. See? Way to be prudent. Now I'm going to cut four pieces of easy solder to go onto there. more my flux onto my circle and I'm going to set my pieces on my circle flux will help them stick so if they're not sticking dab a little bit of flux on there and they should get rid of they want to balance on that Or not. Okay, fine. Screw you. I'm not going to answer for this. Sorry, y'all. It's Thursday night, and it's been a week, so here we go. So, pick transfer is actually the way that I prefer to solder. So, basically what that means is I'm going to pick up a piece of solder on my solder pick, and then I'm going to transfer it onto my metal piece. So, um, for me, it's very easy because I've been doing it for a number of years, but it's not easy for everyone, which is why I generally teach solder placement rather than pick transfer, but at this point, I am losing patience. Okay, so now that I have pick transferred all my solder onto this decorative loop, I'm going to come back to my eye here. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to flux all around the outside. And I'm going to take my decorative loop. I'm going to place it solder side down right around that bezel setting. In theory, it should fit. Resist the temptation to touch it because it's hot. I have a black eye. I mean, Lori's not wrong. Just not a black eye attached to my head. No, but it could be attached to my eye. Well, I mean, but then Heather would have a black eye, and we don't want that either. There we go. 
All right, so now that is snug down around my setting. Now we're going to heat this again so that my little decorative circle solders down to my eye. Now my solder's flowed and bonded my little decorative bit onto my piece. Now I'm going to flip my eye face down, like so, and I'm going to grab my little eyelashes that I made and I'm going to curve them and I'm going to decide how many of them do I want. And I think I've got one too many, so I'm going to just trim off this one that's kind of hanging out on the outside. I'm going to trim off my extra wire. It looks like a very grotesque eye now. I mean, Corvus is not wrong. It, it's not exactly the prettiest eye ever, but um, I promise once you pickle it and polish it, it's pretty, which of course we're not going to do mm, on the stream gosh. tonight. but. Um, pickle the heist. But that's how you get it pretty. So I'm just gonna just drown the whole back of this in flux because I've got two things to solder on to the back here. I've got my eyelashes and I've got the actual functional part of my hair for. So that means more solder. This I can probably place though. I shouldn't have to quick transfer it because I've got a nice flat surface here. I'm going to use about three pieces for my eyelashes and one big piece for my hair fork. So that's four pieces of easy solder again. <laughs> and I'm going to take my pieces of solder, I'm going to just set them evenly spaced across the top. That's where I'm going to put my eyelashes and then one kind of in the middle right there that's where my fork is going to go so now I'm going to go ahead and sweat those pieces onto the back of my piece so sweating for most of you who have been on the beating dream stream is a familiar term for you it means that I'm going to take these and I'm going to melt them essentially Seasick. I just want to bring this up a little bit. Just need to no. <laughs> Not even trying to make you seasick. I'm just trying to bring my camera up so that it's a little bit better in focus. Which failed utterly, so let me actually do the focus thing now that we're at the soldering part. nice and scary. I mean, Corvus is not wrong. You can have whatever kind of eye you want, whether it's grotesque or not grotesque. And again, this is something that like once we, there we go, that's better. Um, once we pickle it and polish it, it's going to be less gross and, and more pretty. So you just kind of have to decide what you want. Alright, so I'm going to sweat these all down onto my piece. I mean, I'm just moving nice and steady around. Let's 
again, it's a big piece of metal, so it's gonna take a minute. Um, no, Megan, actually, tumbling's great for this design. And, and sometimes your wires will get bent, but you can always bend them back. But with the complexity of this design, tumbler is absolutely the best way to polish it up. Slaughters are all now ready for me to attach my bits and pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that up a bit. Take my eyelashes, which I've already formed, and lay them down on my piece and then solder them down. Be careful with the skinny wire because it does kind of want to melt. You do want to make sure you've got your pick in your hand and you want to make sure that you've got some contact with that wire and that solder that you sweated onto the back of your eye. worked like a charm. This one melted a little bit, but it's in the back, so no worries. And there we go. Alright, so that's our little eyelashes. And the last thing that we need to do in order to make this piece is we need to take our fork that we made before, and we need to make sure to flex that bronze piece thoroughly. We also want to just have a little bit more flex onto the back of our eye. Lay that on top of that piece of solder that we have already sweat onto the back of our piece and heat the bejesus out of this until it all bonds together. to heat everything and any metal you're not actively heating is acting as a heat sink. Make sure there's contact between the metal you're trying to solder and your actual piece of solder. And there we go, right? See it? 
spreading underneath. Yes. All right, let's turn off the heat. And there we go. That is our sawn and soldered hair fork. So what happens next with this particular piece? Because it is, as Corvus said, it is a grotesque eye. At this point, it's gross. It's full of fire scale. It's full of flux residue, like, ew. And now it's going to set my work surface on fire. Not quite. So what's going to happen with this now is I'm going to put it in my tumbler. It's going to tumble in my tumbler, which is a vibratory machine. Um, you can also use a rotary tumbler with stainless steel shot and water and soap. And it's going to be in there for about a day or two. And then it's going to be nice and shiny. I'm going to pull it out and then I'm going to set my tiger eye in this center bezel and I'm going to have my fun hair fork. But for now, this is where we're at and um, we're going to go ahead and tumble this. Again, that's going to be a process that's going to take 24 to 48 hours. So I will go ahead and um, set this stone for you at some point on a future stream, maybe on Saturday, maybe next week, Torch Thursday, we shall see. But that's it for our sawn and soldered hair fork for tonight. Um, if you've gotten to this point, you've done good work. And also, I'm really tired, so it's definitely time to go home and eat something. So thanks so much for hanging out with us. I'm watching you. I'm glad you were watching me. Um, for our Torch Thursday Sawn and Soldered Hair Fork, um, again, thank you all so very much for hanging out with us on the Beat and Dream stream. We really appreciate each and every one of you. So I'm Allison from Beat and Dreams in Dallas, Judgy Hair Fork, right? <laughs> I'm Allison from Beat and Dreams in Dallas, Texas. We are an actual brick and mortar retail bead store. Um, we're here in Dallas, Texas, and um, we're here to feed your need to bead Monday through Saturday from 1 to 6. If you're not local in Dallas, you can find us on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beading dream. It's like my third eye. Um, twitch. Well, <laughs> hi, Dad. Yeah, 91 degrees in Wisconsin. Still weird. So we'll be back on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beading dream on Saturday. Saturday we are doing a crochet tutorial. We're doing a crochet pendant tutorial. Tomorrow we will not be on Twitch. We will not be on Facebook. You will find us on Zoom for Crafty Cocktail Time. Um, if you don't have those Zoom credentials, email us beatingdreamsdallas at gmail.com and we will get them sent to you. So that's it. I'm out. Everyone have a great night. Um, we'll see you on Zoom tomorrow and back on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dreams, Saturday at 6 p.m. It is crochet, Sophia, crochet with wire, and a stone without a hole in it, so that's for Saturday. Okay, everyone take care. Bye!